Hi, I'm Danger Dan Jers, the host and GM of the D&D Real Play podcast, d and Dark. Join us on Wednesdays for an absurd, over-the-top comedy horror adventure starring some of history's most infamous monsters. I'm Ben Magnet. I play Mary Frankenstein, our barbarian. I am Daniel Cruz. I am playing Imhotep the Mummy, our cleric. I'm Jordan, and I play Larry Talbot, a lycanthropic warlock. I am Grayson, playing Jack Griffin, the Invisible Man, the party's rogue. I am Aaron. I play the Phantom of the Opera, our bard. For more information, go to dndarkpodcast.com and listen to us anywhere you find podcasts. Hey everybody, I would like to welcome you to another episode of Pop Culture Gems. This is a series where we talk to amazing creators, artists, cosplayers, voice actors, and so much more. If you like the interviews we do with these terrific guests, give us a thumbs up and subscribe to our YouTube channel, the CFG channel. Uh, We also release Pop Culture Gems on all podcast services like Apple, Google Podcasts, Stitcher Radio, and so much more. Or... Go to our main website, confreaksandgeeks.com, to our main website, uh, to our main website to not miss an episode. Today, I am interviewing a voice actor who is putting their mark in the voice acting world. He has been in great anime series as ten- the tennis prodigy Ryoma Echizen in the Prince of Tennis series, the funny voice Pika in the One Piece, uh, a One Piece series, as well as Bia Shinen in a uh, skate and so much more. I would like to welcome Rai McKeon to the show. How are you doing, sir? I'm doing pretty good, man. Thank you so much for having me. <laughs> That's great. That is great. I hope you're having an ex- uh, a great a great day. You know, it's actually kind of weird. It's uh freezing here in Texas, and <laughs> I don't know why. It's, it's yeah, odd. no, it's it's been weird. It's been really, really weird. Uh, I'm kind of glad I left Texas when I did, so I avoided a second ice storm, basically. <laughs> oh my god, it is crazy. You know what's funny? Like, so I uh, was in the process of moving. Uh, so I moved my studio and I was like, okay, cool. I don't have to deal because I was in an apartment. And then all of a sudden uh, I was like, okay, I, I decided I bought a house and I have some space. and I was going to be uh, make one of these rooms in my studio. Uh, I was like, don't have to worry about apartment living. Don't share any walls. Then winter storm hit, And I was like, and I was like, oh, don't worry. This is a brand new house. My, my uh, heater uh, was just uh, got, uh, got damaged and I had to shut down the heater. Uh, oh, when God. yeah during the winter giant winter storm so my my house went down to like less than th- like i think 48 degrees in the house so i was 40. like yeah it was insane it was ridiculous i was like this is a, this, this house is only three months old what the hell's happening yeah it's just so ridiculous <laughs> yeah i was just like oh god it's like of course it happens but anyways but yeah but yeah but that's nah, it's all good now they fixed it i don't have to pay a cent perfect <laughs> perfect now that's so, great that's yeah. great that's good, that's good. That's good. <laughs> but anyways uh but let's get this party started man it was great it's great to see ha- have you here it's always fun um but uh let's uh let me ask you what i ask everybody here uh what is your story like what got you into voice acting um, so I'm like the perfect example of a fan turned professional. Um, I grew up watching and playing video, watching anime, playing video games, uh, pretty much my entire life. And then when I turned about like 15, 16, I discovered that people were doing voice acting online as a hobby. And I was like, that is so cool. And I always felt kind of alienated as the kid who could pick out voice actors from like his favorite shows. I'd spend like hours going on Wikipedia and just going down the rabbit hole and being like, oh, wait. Yuri Lowenthal was in this show and in this show and he was in this show. Oh my God. And then Troy Baker was in this anime and then he was in this video game and he played this video game character and he did this back in the day. I remember watching that. Uh, so I was that kind of guy as a, uh, when I was younger. Um, and uh, so as I started to delve into things online, which <laughs> I uh, I kind of owe to Alejandro Saab because I discovered him when I was in high school uh, <laughs> and saw what he was doing online. And I was like, I want to do that too. And uh, 
shortly after getting into it, um, I kind of started to steal my resolve a little bit. I was like, I really want to do this as a career, not just as a hobby. I want to pursue this as a career. Um, and I kind of spun my exact reason why into uh, being that I wanted to do what a lot of the like, you know, established older generation of voice actors or rather like the first big generation of the modern era of voice acting did for me growing up. Uh, give me means to uh, kind of distract myself from all this, a lot of the struggles that I had in my life because uh, I didn't have the best childhood. So I ended up playing a lot of video games, watching a lot of anime to help distract myself and kind of to help give me the life lessons I wasn't getting. Um, so I want to do the same thing to other people that was done to me, uh, being able to just have an impact of some kind on somebody's life while doing something that I love. Oh. And uh, now I'm doing it. You know, I'm just I'm just a guy who gets to do his dream job and I'm just couldn't be happier. That is awesome. That's awesome to hear. And uh, uh, did you initially uh, well, like from your like when you knew like how, like uh, did you say like high school or so around when you decided to start going serious into it? And mm -hmm. uh, from there, like, uh, did you like did you do from high school and jump right into it immediately or did you go go to like colleges or any kind of college or anything like that to kind of, you know? So I, uh, I was pretty much self-taught for a while because I went to uh, a math, science and engineering school. Uh, cause my dad was like, Hey, you're going to a smart school. <laughs> cause you're not getting into the art school when I was graduating middle school. Um, and I was like, okay, dad. Um, but, um, I did go to college. Uh, thankfully when you start off online, you can kind of do things at your own pace because there's so many different fan projects. There's so many smaller indie budget projects that you can audition for that. Like, you know, if you have a decent enough setup, you can read for them and then, you know, get experience through that. But I wanted practical experience. So I initially got my acting start from speech and debate because I had to learn how to care what I was talking about. So I basically learned how to emote through there. And then I went to college for theater. I went to college for about a year and a half. I went to Palm Beach State College in Florida. Um, and they have a really great theater program there. It's very small, but it was very, very, very well worth the uh, the time I spent there. I did improv all throughout. I did uh, theater all throughout. I was in every single production uh, that we did while I was at the college. And uh, it was great. I had a lot of fun. And then at 20, I moved to Texas. And that was like the official start to my bigger professional career. I love that because I mean, that legitimately should like that background in general, because most of the people have like, they say that they, they got their craft from like, Oh, they were interested in like, you know, I mean, not saying it's a wrong or anything, but they're sure. interested in uh like, you know, sh like a uh, Broadway and stuff like that. And then everything, and then they were working their way up to get to that point, And then they saw voice acting, but no, you legitimately were a fan of it. Cause you were already somewhat interested in it. And then you're like, okay, what do I need to do to do to get where I want to be and you just start and you built yourself up that way that so that i mean i commend you on that that's pretty Thanks, cool man yeah, yeah it's 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 just one of those cool things where it's like i decided to go into a very specialized industry from the get-go when it comes to acting since especially when i wanted to mostly work in anime and at the start like learning how to do adr especially really early on is is not an easy process because adr isn't that easy especially for people who you know, like I'm used to doing Broadway or theater or anything, but like ADR. Mm -hmm. So it's not easy by any means. Thankfully, we have it a little bit easier when we work on anime because sometimes the, you know, the mouth flaps aren't as complicated as like human flaps. When like, say, when you look at the Lord of the Rings trilogy and you learn that 90% of that movie is ADR in because uh, they filmed it all out in the open in New Zealand and uh, the majority of that audio cannot be used. <laughs> all the wind and uh, the crazy. Yeah, I can easily. Yeah. And it's just, it's so crazy to think that like 90% of the audio you hear in that movie was ADR. So the actors had to act over themselves a second time. And they still got amazing performances out of it. That's oh the crazy god, thing. yeah! It's like uh, what was it? What was it? The Wolverine? No, it was uh, yeah. it was, it was for Wolf Logan. Yeah, for, for Logan. Logan when they showed when they showed Hugh Jackman going like crazy inside the booth, and they were like, people were wondering why. It's like, oh, it's probably because it was just bad. It, you couldn't use the audio when they're, he's actively running and he's hit it outside in the forest and stuff and all this nature and everything. But no, you're totally right. You're totally right. ADR is a, uh, you know, I think it's a really underrated like form itself uh, with that in, in itself in the process. But uh, no, I totally, I totally, I totally understand. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, oh, I'm sorry. We were gonna say? No, no, it's fine. I was just, oh, I was just okay. agreeing with you. 
Oh, okay. And uh, were you generally in, like like you were saying before, uh, earlier, but a little more into it, but were you generally in the anime gaming scene before, like, having a career in voice acting? And uh, if so, like, what kind of shows and uh, games were your na- your natural go-to? So uh, I was very much into it. Um, <laughs> um, so uh, one of my favorite shows of all time that I watched when I was in middle school uh, is Gurren Lagann, and it was specifically the dub for Gurren Lagann. Um, that show is my favorite piece of anime media and arguably one of my favorite pieces of media to ever exist. Um, and I do a yearly rewatch of that every single year and I still wow. cut my eyes out every single time because I <laughs> love that show so much. It's so inspirational to me and the performances in there just continue to like leave me in awe, uh, for a show that is like going on 15 years old now, which is insane. Uh, but in terms of games, um, I am a huge JRPG nerd. So I played like a lot of Final Fantasies. I play a lot of the more obscure like anime JRPGs. I've played like the, the Tales of franchise. I love the Tales of franchise. Um, I've kind of played a little bit of everything growing up. I mostly gravitate towards RPGs, especially the anime ones, because I loved the anime art style growing up. And I was like, I like that. Even if it's a bad video game, I like that. Um, but uh, other specific examples, um, I was a huge PS2 guy. So I played a lot of PS2 games. I had like well over 100 because I was frankly addicted. My mom fed into that addiction. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, but like a game like Rogue Galaxy, which was done by Level 5, fantastic game. Um, I played a, a decent chunk of anime fighters, even though I sucked at them. Um, I played some of the Blaze Blue games, but I never really got into, into them. Uh, I played like Persona. Uh, I played Persona 4, Persona 3, the Persona 4 arena games all those um yeah i and i love persona um still to this day uh kingdom hearts it's one of my favorite it's my favorite game series of all time um i i I would if i had it out i'd show it to you i just bought uh, (laughs) a a watch from the anniversary collection um because i love it so much wow do the uh what's it called like uh with garden login itself because like i remember uh i mean like that it was funny because like i i like garden login as well the uh uh that pace is very interesting because it was like what a twi- was it twenty six episodes? I think it's twenty six episodes. Twenty six or twenty seven. Yeah, two. yeah, a good bit. Like it was literally three different story arcs, eight episodes each. Like the way pacing was in that, it's one of my favorite like examples to kind of go to because they they didn't mess around. It was uh yeah so yeah, Garden Long is definitely one of my top five there. Uh, have you ever tried a an RPG called Trails of Cold Steel? Oh, yes, I have. Uh, I actually really like the Cold Steel series. I have fallen so far behind. I am on a third of the way through three, and I just have not touched it since. Um, So I need to either restart it or pick it back up and pray to God I remember everything. Because I know Trails into Reverie is coming out later this year, and I'm really excited for that. And uh, so uh, I need to get back into it because I I loved the first Trails of Cold Steel. I loved the second one even better. And the third one so far has been good, but the Trails series always has this thing where, um, where the first game is always just set up, so it's good, but it's so much like lower stakes until the very end, and then the sequel is like, oh, nothing but stakes, all the cool stuff's happening. Um, <laughs> I was talking to one of my friends, uh, Brendan Blaber, aka Jell Apocalypse, and he he's also played the games before, and he, he like they, that's basically his one gripe. It's like, yeah, the first game usually sucks, but then the second game is amazing because the first game is like always going to be better uh, the first game is just set up and like nothing really important happens until the second game and like the two duologies oh my god like uh when i played the first game i'm like uh, i mean i the best way to describe the first game is a 40 hour prologue but like the uh uh but the, it was like okay i did all the work and then you go to the very end and you're like whoa there there's mechs in this <laughs> and then, yeah dude <laughs> like that's the cool thing it's like <laughs> It's just it's just basically like Persona JRPG like like traditional JRPG like hybrid, um, and it's like you you're there for the gameplay because it's such a different style of gameplay. Like it's this minimal changes they put on it, it just make a huge difference. And then it's like okay, you know, there's some bigger stuff going on. Cool, it's just fun school shenanigans. We're exploring the world. They're learning about stuff. There's some cute moral lessons here. And then it's like oh, stuff's starting to hit the fan. Oh, wow. Where did this giant mech come from? Wait, why does the main character have weird powers now? What? (laughs) Um, And then had to wait so long for the sequel. And Mm -hmm. then the sequel comes out and you're like, I'm in deep. (laughs) And 
Yeah, the, the, the thing is, too, the sequel did this one thing. It's a very small thing that I appreciated the heck out of. They started you at level 50 when you started that game. Yes, It's yes. like they fully acknowledge that, yeah, you're not starting off at level one again. No, you're starting <laughs> off at level 50. And yes. you're going to just go up to, like, level 80 to 90 over the course of the game. You know, when I think about it, though, too, that they kind of they've they never really like, I mean, the main crew, uh, Team 7 or whatever, uh, uh, they never went back down to team like to level one. Like they've always they, they've always been ratioed up because uh, in the third one, it's the next generation. And mm-hmm. yet and yet you started from one, but your character, uh, Reen, is starting at level 25 or 30 or whatever. And then so on and I so forth. It, I, just Reen, up. I still think Reen starts at level one, if not a little bit higher than like his students, uh, just because uh, he's kind of nerfed because he's gotten weaker as time's gone on. Uh, because plot reasons but uh, like all of his friends are like you know their levels are ratioed to be lower but they are still like like for all intents and purposes their kit is stronger than the majority of the people that like you'll get into your class uh but regardless um yeah i'm really excited to finish up three because there's some plot threads in three that i was really vibing with um and i'm like the fourth game's coming out and that's when like the crossover stuff really really starts to come in and i'm like yep (laughs) <laughs> i can't wait too because like I, I i'm actually stuck where you're at too i'm at three i like i've been stuck at three for like two years and i've been like uh i'm like oh i'm gonna get back into it then i get then i decided to play nostalgia and i started playing um ease eight and oh, uh yeah. love that game eases are, are really underrated games but these games the, the game is really good and uh and then i was like oh, okay i'm done and then final fantasy 7 remake came out and then i, and I don't even remember yep. that's killer <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah so uh before your career uh were you uh like were you also in the con scene as well like uh, like were uh what did you ever go go out to different kinds of places and and uh check Just, it out i was like i was kind of like in and out of the con scene i wasn't super into it i didn't go to my first con until i was like 16 17 mm-hmm. um and that was when I lived in Florida. So I went to Florida's biggest convention, MegaCon, for my first time. Oh, con. God, that's a lot. <laughs> yeah. And MegaCon is like a pretty, like a huge, like multicultural, like multi fandom con. So, like, especially back in like when I went, which was like 2014, 2015 ish, uh, it was like 2014. Um, that was when The Walking Dead was at its peak of like popular. So they had all the Walking Dead actors. They had like a lot of like pop culture actors. Uh, they had the late, great Jason David Frank there too um you know they had a couple of anime voice actors here and there um i think i didn't even see most of the anime voice actors because there was just so many guests and the con was so huge that i didn't go to see as many um but that was my first con and then i didn't go to too many growing up um i went to a smaller first year con that was also in florida that was in orlando called omni expo that i'm not sure if it's still running or not i think it is um but that was shortly after the attack on titan dub was announced so they made it an attack on titan con where they had every single actor that was in attack on titan at the time there at the con basically uh with the exception i think of like ashley birch who had to call out for like uh some work obligations i forget Um, that she was a part of that (laughs) like every time yeah she she was the she was originally sasha and then just you know couldn't reprise due to being busy and other stuff and scheduling conflicts i assume um but uh But yeah, that was my second con, and then I didn't go to a con for a long, long time. Um, And then I think my the last con I went to uh, before I moved to Texas was uh, a con in Texas. It's called Anime Fest. Uh, It's one of my personal favorite conventions. It is a really good, busy, medium-sized convention that's held in Dallas, Um, and uh, I love how it's run. It is a like total nonprofit anime convention. It's great. So the showrunners make no money off of it. Four hundred one c all that stuff. yeah, it's it's great. Uh, I love the people who run it. Um, I'm friends with a lot of them now. Uh, and I loved it so much that actually when I volunteered at it uh, for like two years, <laughs> I volunteered on the guest handling side of things. So I helped out in 2018 as a guest handler. And then I helped out uh, in 2019 when uh, Game Fest was introduced. Um, and uh, yeah, it was great. I loved Anime Fest so much. And then the last con that I went to as like an attendee before I was like, hey, I really shouldn't be going to cons too much anymore because my career is starting to build up uh, was uh, IckyCon in Houston. 
in 2019 as well. Wow, wait, that's still there? Wow, I thought that disappeared a long time ago. No, I think IkiCon just, I think it recently switched the locations where it's held. Um, I'm not sure if it's at the same hotel in Houston, but it still happens. It still happens. Wow, okay, that's pretty cool. Oh, uh, man, like, uh, everyone's told me to go try to check out Anime Fest. The only convention I've really been here, been in, because uh, I don't usually go out to a lot of anime uh, cons anymore either, uh, but the biggest one is... Uh, the biggest one was Akon and then um um San Japan, I believe. I yeah, San Japan, San Japan is a good one too. It's it's a yeah. pretty big one. Uh yeah, Akon's pretty big too. Uh mm. I know like over like the last like five ish years or so, they've kind of had some like ownership like switches. I don't know what is happening with the Akon I don't know stuff either. either. Yeah, because like I, was, I don't But it's weird it's like, like location wise, they're like, Hey, we're gonna put it in the fairgrounds. It's like what? Why? <laughs> it's yeah, that was a weird year. That, that was after they first switched ownership. That was a very, 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 very weird year. I got sunburned the year. Oh, yeah, I went to Acon just to see some friends that year because I got in for free. Um, and that was a very, very weird con, con scene to be at. A uh, very weird con venue. I got sunburned like there was no tomorrow because it was in the middle of summer. I wore a tank top. Uh, not fun. Not yeah. Fun. I I was doing interviews and I had to cancel because I was drenched in sweat because of the uh, mm -hmm. humidity. It was like, what? It's like, why would you have it in so many different locations? And then yet, like, uh, I was like, nah, I'm not going to come out when I'm all like perspirated and stuff. But it was crazy. It was crazy. But yeah, mm -hmm. but it, it got, it's better. <laughs> it's not, it's not at the fairgrounds anymore. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but, yeah, there you go. Uh uh like uh oh wow i didn't finish this up but uh one of the most like extra sports animes that i've ever seen was is prince of tennis because i love like i mean you know with the amount of anime you've watched like one of the best kind of animes are sports animes because they are incredibly extra <laughs> like like uh on whatever yeah. they do and uh and i believe prince of tennis and prince of tennis has been around forever uh so it's been like, around the, for a minute like 20 yeah. plus years at this point yeah, yeah. So like when you got the when uh when you got the role as the prodigy uh, uh I can never remember Ryoma Echizen, I believe. Mm -hmm. Uh yeah, like just like what did you like uh like were you aware or did you know the kind of the character himself already or did you like what what uh uh how how did what was your feeling when you when you got that role? So it was a very interesting experience because um The Prince of Tennis is an example of a show that I remember watching on Toonami Jetstream when I was younger, when Toonami Jetstream was a thing, uh, back when Viz tried to dub it. Um, and I remember watching very select episodes, only a couple here and there, because I it was I was like, Tennis anime, that sounds lame as a kid. Cause it's tennis. Who cares about tennis? <laughs> um apparently I should because now I'm in it. Um, <laughs> um but uh I remember uh, I auditioned and I was like, I, you know, I don't really know if I'll book him or not. He needs to sound cool. And I don't really sound cool. And I wasn't like as experienced when I auditioned as I am now. Um, and so I remember Howard Wong, uh, the director, like one of the lead writers, script supervisor, et cetera, for the show and for the project. Uh, he called me. He's like, hey, man, uh, can I call you real quick? Uh, nothing bad. I just want to call you. And I was like, sure. And my heart's beating out of my chest. I'm like, did I, did I, did I screw up? What did I do? What did I do? And then he's like, hey, man, uh, so uh, he, he called me to tell me that he wanted me as Ryoma. Um, and I was like, oh, and I'm like on the phone. I'm not freaking out. Uh, but I was like and I was uh, working at my computer and uh, and I was like, yeah, yeah, no, I'm totally down, man. Thank you so much. Yeah, yeah, this could be awesome. Really excited. And he's like, yeah, I expect to get reached out to you about booking and then like uh, within the week. And I was like, cool. And then immediately afterwards, I like jumped out of my chair and I was like, let's go because, <laughs> uh it's just so cool like that's a that's like to audition for the face of a long-standing series and to become the face of that long-standing series is so cool um it's so so cool but uh I, i've come to love prince of tennis a lot uh for all of its eccentricities and how wacky it gets um, we had a very interesting way of going about Prince of Tennis when we when it came to dubbing it, though, because we actually started with the Prince of Tennis 2, the sequel series, did all of that, and then we went back and started working on the original retro show. Oh, you retrograded? Y'all yeah. went backwards and did all of it? I, I didn't know y'all did the first part either. Wow. Yeah, no, we've, been, we, we've done a good chunk with the first part so far. So we did the first 30 episodes, which includes OVAs of the origin of prince of tennis 2 then we got sent back to start at episode 51 
because I don't believe Crunchyroll had gotten the license to episodes one through 50 yet. Um, and we were told to start doing episodes from the original series in batches um, from episode 51 up to a certain point. And then when we get, once we got to that certain point, like, hey, we want you to go back and do one through 50. And we're like, okay. So we double retrograded. So we started halfway through the show, basically. Um, and then got to a certain point. Then went back to the beginning and caught up to ourselves. And then we got, and then we were able to start picking back up where we left off before. Um, That's but, impressive. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So we had to start where all these characters already had their development. Um, and like we're going through new development to then go back to them mid development and then go back to the very beginning. <laughs> um, but uh, well, Prince of Tennis does have like it's really extra moments because of the framing and they make every move seem extra like dramatic and stuff like that. Um, it's generally pretty fun because uh, especially for me, I don't really get to play cool characters like Ryoma. So uh, as I've like been working on the show, which we've been working on Prince of Tennis for as like as franchise for like two years straight almost at this point um you're still actively so yeah you're still actively working on this as well like are y'all almost done or where are y'all at right I, now I, I know how much i'm allowed to say but like we're still oh, working on it yeah i don't want yeah i don't want to get to the position where it's yeah. like okay yeah that's um, cool wow yeah but uh we've been uh we've been we've been hard to grind and like it's it's insane because it take it like the amount of work we've done in two years is kind of freaking insane um and i know there's still more and there's probably there's the potential for more to come because we had a new season uh this past summer uh which we doubled up on we were working on the original show and that at the same time uh which is crazy uh so we were simul dubbing the new show while also working on the old series um but uh there's a lot of heart into prince of tennis uh admit, like underneath all the extra like tennis mumbo jumbo and bs um which i feel like a lot of like sports anime kind of take inspiration from like haiku is a really good example where it's like all about camaraderie and like uh, like a lot of good relationships with the sport and within your team and teamwork and stuff like that. Prince of Tennis kind of has that too. I think just, you know, on a different sort of level. So, but there's, I like to say Prince of Tennis just has a lot of heart to it. And uh, there's like nice smaller stories to be told as well. And it's all about like the relationships between the characters and how they choose to grow within tennis and how that affects their character too. Um, and it's, it's just, you know, it's great. And there's, like, this is kind of, like, a small spoiler, but it's already been kind of told to me and stuff like that. Like, ultimately, like, the best way to have fun, uh, not just to have fun, to, to play tennis in, in Prince of Tennis lore is to have fun with it. Um, and that's basically when you understand and admit that tennis is fun and you're playing tennis to have fun versus just to win. That's when you unlock Tennis Ultra Instinct, um, <laughs> basically. Um, so uh, that don't that doesn't happen until the very, very end of the original series in like the Nationals OVAs when Ryoma's at the finals of Nationals in his final match. But he understands that like have playing tennis is fun and then he unlocks the pinnacle of mastery, which is basically and like Tennis Ultra Instinct where he just gets to, he get, just gets super overpowered but it's really cool, really cool moment. I, I just love that they it took them fifty episodes to be like, you know what? Just admit that it's fun. <laughs> no, it's not like, even fifty episodes. It takes well over a hundred. Oh it takes over God. like hundred and fifty to get like nationals or OVAs, and the original oh, show goes up wow, to like episode right. one hundred seventy eight. Uh, so, it's that it's that big. I thought it was like a, yeah. I thought it's something like a hundred and five, like a hundred. Holy no, crap! No, no, no. The can the canon stuff ends at episode one twenty eight, if I remember correctly, and then it pulls an OG Naruto where it has like fifty episodes of filler that literally does not matter. And then they went back and started doing OVAs for the rest of the canon stuff. Oh, okay. Wow, so they made mm. stuff up. They made fifty something episodes. Of, they make it stuff up. Ooh, I hate. Yeah, and it's that. not like it's not like OG Naruto filler where some of that filler was actually pretty good. Uh, it's just stupid. Apparently, from what I've been told, but I have I'm 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 pretty much experiencing. Excuse me, Prince of Tennis as we've been working on it. So that's my one thing. Uh, so I don't really watch ahead too much unless I have to. That makes sense. That makes sense. And like, uh, I'm kind of, kind of, kind of go backwards a little bit because I know this wasn't your first, like, you know, main protagonist mm -hmm. role. Like your first one was, uh, uh, you played the main protagonist Rito Yuki in the two, two love you or two love Rue. I hate that, that <laughs> series name. I hate it so much every time. Uh, yeah. So like, uh, so like what was, uh, I mean, prior to like you getting it, you, this was really, this was legitimately your first time getting the protagonist role, uh, 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 all of it. So I just kind of wanted to know, like, what was your feeling when you when you became when you got the lead role for the first time? 
So it it was really really cool uh because uh I remember when I auditioned for David Wald the director of the first season was like I want you and I'm going to make sure that you get this this audition is a glorified formality because I want you and I'm going to make sure that you get this. Um so that was really sweet of him to say. Um and I auditioned and I was just like cool. Uh I was like he helped like he directed my audition cuz he that's just how it was supposed to go. Um, and, uh, we sent it off and I was like, you know, he wants me for it. That's really, really cool. If it happens, if it, hap it happens, it happens. And then, um, I got the, the booking email. Uh, I got an email from his like, Hey, it's official. You're him. And I got, and I woke up to that email and I literally jumped out of my bed and I did push ups. I had so much energy. <laughs> I did like, I did like 10 push ups, then jumped up and I was, I ran around my apartment because I was so excited. It's my first like huge series lead. I had voiced like one lead character prior in a small OVA called This Boy Suffers from Crystallization. But like I had not been like a, a series lead um like for a twenty six episodes series yeah. and let alone like one that I knew had multiple seasons. Uh so I was so excited. But I was still very green because uh that happened a year like a year and a half into me living in Texas. Um so I booked that like uh pretty sure like beginning of Texas ish. Um and uh, and then uh, shortly afterwards, unfortunately, my dad passed away right as I was getting ready to to go ahead and go to Houston to record everything. Um, and uh, it's OK. It happened. Um, so uh, I just I was kind of put in the situation like, well, do I push this back? Do I go and do it? And, you know, David Wald, God bless that man's heart. I love him so much. He uh, he checked in with me. and was just like, hey free token weight and i was like no i think i should come down it'll be good for me and so i went down uh it was a very healthy experience david wald was an is a fantastic director and he made a lot of uh made took the time to make sure there were a lot of teaching moments uh for me so sorry my cat's trying to jump up on my chair too uh there were a lot of teaching moments because i was still so green uh but working on that show with him uh we basically had the time of our lives uh we would take like laughing breaks uh, because of just the insane stuff that we would say, uh, we kind of we kind of hammed up and made the script a lot funnier as we were going on to. Uh, not to say that it wasn't funny from the get go, but it's like we just saw some things we're like we ought to take this. We're gonna take this. Um, and I mean, when you're season's... when you're oh, reenacting, okay, oh, sorry, yeah, no, sorry, my bad. But like, if when you're reenacting something, when you're cr you're virtually creating a script of the translations, you could fit something in the, a thing or two. Oh yeah, like especially that. when you're in the booth recording, it's just you see things, you come up with ideas, like. Let's do this. And then we do it. Um, but that first season is kind of like is more tradi in line with a traditional like etchy harem compared to the rest of the franchise. Um, <laughs> uh, and there's a lot more of like heart to the first season because it's just a giant allegory for puberty. Uh, I like to say. Um, but we like I said, we would take laughing breaks. David Wald would take his they take the time to like teach me things while we were doing things and sent I dubs differently. So we kind of um with the sentai does just the chase method where there's no beeps you just wait a beat after like the japanese starts going and then you start acting and then they'll like you know line things up after the fact um and then you go back review and then you adjust as needed uh but he we he was like slowly but surely was getting me integrated into everything uh i was uh just learning a whole lot i was having to <laughs> learn how to scream on a consistent basis um <laughs> Because Rito is crazy. <laughs> yes, he um, is. But, uh, but yeah, so uh, that show holds a very special place in my heart, too. Um, just because it was such a great time, great experience with David Wald. Um, and, yeah, I, I I loved working on that show so, so much. That's awesome. It was, did it you, was oh, okay, did sorry. You do, oh, did you do all of the, uh, 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 all of it? Like, all of the we, series? We did everything. Except oh, okay. for the OVAs. We did the entire show. <laughs> like, we did we did moto to love Roo, we did darkness and darkness too um we did everything oh wow uh, yeah and it's all available to purchase on blu-ray and or stream on high dive with i think the exception of darkness too i could be mistaken though um but uh but yeah um so uh, we did everything david wald uh unfortunately left uh sentai uh after the first season so it the rest of the the shows uh uh, the rest of the season, uh, not seasons, uh, seasons rather, uh, fell to the other director on the project, uh, John Swayze. And John took, uh, yeah, and he was directing the rest of it. And it was still fun. It was still fun uh, outside of the moments where I saw, like, the popsicle scene and I freaked the hell out because um, I wasn't prepped for it mentally. 
See, I have no idea because I've only saw the, like the first ser- the first series, but like I'm actually kind of worried to even ask. Good, good. <laughs> you no, know, good. Stay innocent. Stay innocent. First season's my favorite. I think it's the best. Watch that one. And unless you're super down bad or you like laughing at really absurd harem situations, um, don't watch past the first season. How close are we to like I mean, are we talking about borderline uh, hentai level or uh, what? It gets there. It gets there. <laughs> or it high school D and D kind of and more. Uh, or? Yeah, it's it's kind of like high school DXD a little bit. Uh, <laughs> oh no! Uh, just 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 take my word for it. Like we had fun where we could, but they bring the horny levels up like from like a six that was in the first show to like a fifteen, wow. starting with darkness. Moto two lovers. Moto two lover is like more of like a clip show, a glorified clip show. Um, and it, it, it like ants brings the ante up to like an eight or nine, but then like when you get to darkness proper, when it's like full episode plot lines, that's when it gets to be like the absurd <laughs> levels of horny. Like, oh, oh my man. god, I can't believe you're in this you're in this position. And then there, there's some very specific examples because I rewatched some of it recently for the first time, and I was like, oh god, oh god, uh. Uh, uh yeah like let's just say there's a there's there's a little too much spreading uh and that's all i'm gonna say dear lord uh wait they, they're they don't in middle show school right below the belt they're they're in high school oh uh, thank god <laughs> uh, yeah they don't show anything they don't show anything below the belt they imply I mean, what's below the belt and it's like some of the actions they show uh but i'm like poor rito actually <laughs> poor rito this boy cannot catch a break Oh my God! Okay, this is cr- that that is crazy, and yeah, I probably yeah. will <laughs> at that point. Jesus, uh, and uh, like out of all the characters that you've played, uh, is there one that you could relate to? Like one that you could say, yeah, that's that's me. Um, Rito, when in the first season, I was able to throw like a lot of me in there because uh, just because I related a lot to like his his sort of like struggle of dealing with all these conflicting emotions um like yeah he kind of has the the stupid anime protagonist strife of like do i like this girl do i like this girl do i like this this girl or that girl um but like again i like to see the first season of two lover is really something special it's like a giant allegory for puberty similar to how fully coolie is like a, a huge nothing but allegory for puberty being freaking weird and crazy and like you just don't know how to process it um but if i had to choose one specific character um, that I really was able to put a lot of myself into. Um, honestly, uh, my char- my my character in a show called Ame More at the Borderline, Amo Shiba. Uh, he's like he sits m- like most naturally in my regular speaking voice, and like he 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 kind of like was I was able to throw a lot of myself into him because there's a lot of moments, a lot of like really nice downplayed moments where it's like uh, I related to a lot heavily. There's a moment in episode two where he technically becomes like an an outlaw because of one thing he does in episode one. Um, and then he ends up finding an older couple, helps them out, and they say, hey, you can stay here with us. And he just starts breaking down because he's been an orphan for the majority of his life. And like some, like he was offered a place to stay, and that really hit a personal spot at home in my heart. Um, and uh, there's a lot of moments like that in that show that I really, really appreciated. I got to really act in that show, uh, as I like to say. Like, I got to, like, I, he has, Amo has such a breadth of, like, emotions that he experiences and, like, has a really cool character arc uh, throughout the first season and then, like, kind of gets back to that same place in the second chunk of the show. Um, but uh, I really liked working on that show. Uh, working with Griffin Poitou was really, really fun because he had a very specific vision in mind and we were able to just collaborate and we had a lot of fun with it um and then another show uh was uh was skate obviously not to a lesser extent but i related more so to mia on like a much more intrinsic level uh because uh looking at his arc as a whole and like his character uh you really kind of see a lot of like smaller details that they don't put to the forefront he plays games because he's really good at one thing he starts losing losing his friends he doesn't have any friends because he's good at this one thing uh he kind of like shuts people out because like he's been hurt before and he's just a 12 year old kid uh or like 12 13 year old kid and it's like i relate so heavily to that because of your interest and you're good at your interest um and then he just slowly kind of finds his found family and life starts getting better sh- slowly but surely. And he's just growing up ever so slightly, learning to, to be a kid again versus having to be like, you know, like this like skating prodigy who has to like present a lot more mature and skilled than like his peers and even people older than him. 
No, I totally, I totally agree with that. I mean, uh, agree with, with, with Skate. It's kind of funny because it's, I was actually, I think it was one of my questions because, like, I've talked to a lot of different people who were, like, you know, who were in Skate, like uh, Jonah, Jonah Scott and them. Uh, and then, like, he, they have said, that, like, that that's one of, like, the best, like, favorite projects to work on. And I've been so wondering, like, what is it, like, in your words, too, because like, I wanted to know, like, what made Skate such a special series to work on? Uh, it, that show was really just lightning in a bottle. Um, we didn't, since it's anime original, we had no idea how it was going to turn out. Um, we we were really excited for it because it's the skateboarding anime, the only one, which is so cool. Um, and uh, I remember Mia wasn't even on the audition side. And so I read for like Reki and I think like Longa. And I was like, if I get in the show, cool. And then I got cast as Mia. <laughs> and I had not, I not watched the show prior. Um, so I got booked for episode two uh, and they booked me for, they booked me for the, the 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 trailer that they had us dub, and then they also had us uh, they had me in episode two, and they hadn't told me about the trailer, so I assumed I was just doing like bit characters and stuff like that. Um, but then after I recorded episode two, I was like, okay, cool, I'm in this show. Let me actually watch an episode. So I watched the most recent episode, having no context to literally anything beforehand, uh, with the exception of episode two. Um, I watched episode four and I was like, this is really good, and I was like crap this is really good um and so i went to record episode three which i had not i just skipped over and then i saw the insanity that was going on in that show with like the like the skating and like how the animation was stellar the music was fantastic and now in episode three is like mia's big like his it's his episode it's like his in his proper introduction he gets to have like you know his he gets to have his skate his uh, his beef with Longa and there's so much cool stuff there going on. It's like, dude, it's so cool. And then Longa does this really cool thing where like, because his skateboard has like swivel so it can move like a snowboard, he's able to bridge a gap by like swinging the entire board over. And it's so cool. And I literally screamed in my booth. That's so cool. What the hell? <laughs> you know, uh, like during the preview. Yeah. Like, um, but, like when you're actually in the booth, I guess the level of context of what you're talking about, it doesn't really click until you see it all together. Uh, right? You're just worried about yeah. your character until then, right? Yeah, for the most part, thankfully, since this is such a big ensemble show, like when all the characters are together, usually you're given a lot more context to it. And after the, I watched episode four, I started watching it weekly. I was watching the dub as it was releasing, and I started watching the sub as it was releasing. Because, um, dude, I, when I tell you I got hooked, I got hooked. The fourth episode got me real good, and then I just, it continued to get better and better. Um, that show, we had such a great, great, great experience working with our directors, Chris Wakecamp and Kyle Phillips. The script was fantastic. We were also able to like really inject a lot of ourselves into the show and we were able to really kind of like continue to like increase the, uh, I guess like the, the more subtle, like gay tones. And we kind of made the double a lot more gay, which was great. Um, which I loved, uh, but, uh, you know, that. That show just was so much fun to work on. And when it comes to anime original stuff, you don't know if it's going to be good. You don't know if it's going to be bad. You don't know if it's just going to be okay. And that show was truly good all throughout. Um, we have probably one of my favorite episodes of a show I've ever worked on, episode six of that show, which is the Cannon Beach episode, uh, where I get to call Jonah Scott daddy um, in a very high-pitched <laughs> voice. And that's uh, where and, it all and, started. <laughs> yeah. Uh, we were, I remember Jonah messing me. He's like, dude, have you seen the episode of Skate? You had to call me daddy. And I'm like, what? I haven't watched it yet. Let me go watch it right now. And I was like laughing my ass off the entire time. But but yeah, there's just so many factors that go into – that went into Skate. The script was great. Um, the cast was, I think, objectively perfect across the board. Um, and there was so much heart and soul. Everybody was put in the right place. Um, you know, and that's both a biased and unbiased opinion as a fan of the dub and somebody who worked on the dub, uh, separating those two, my opinion is still the same. Like with the exception of trying to be like, oh yes, I was perfect for the role. Cause there could have been somebody who could have possibly been better for the role. I don't know. Um, I, I think the show was cast phenomenally, which helps significantly with making a really good product. And uh, like I said, that show is just lightning in the bottle. And now we got an OVA and a second season coming eventually, which we're all so excited about. And it's just so weird to think that I did skate the Infinity two years ago. 
we were working <laughs> on it two years ago and so much has changed and like i'm just like oh this is so cool so cool it's, is that it, you said it was a crunch roll was that crunch roll original i didn't know that i didn't know that no was. it was uh it was on it was funimation because that was oh. before the merger okay yeah. so it was funimation and then it got put up on crunch rolls one of their first dubs when after the merger happened Oh, okay, man. Because yeah, it sounded like it, yeah, it sounded like y'all y'all enjoyed each other's company. Did y'all do the the dubs to get like you know how like no, we, or it was it still individual? the pandemic. Yeah, oh, it was okay. we did it individual uh, because it was still the pandemic. Uh, I just finished my like my good booth setup when I lived in Texas, and um, it was it was awesome. It was really cool to be able to like record everything remotely. Uh, because it again still thick of the pandemic. And uh, there was very select in-studio recordings at Funimation. They had a procedure, which is really good and everything. But because also the the skate dub was kind of cherry-picked from, like, both actors from both L.A. and Texas and, like, in other areas to, like, m meld together to make this really solid cast. It's just – it's really cool. Um, but we were – well, usually whenever we record anime, unless you're doing, like, a lot – like, the background voices and cues, um, which is, like, that's the only time you'll record in groups. You'll only ever record – uh together on like western media uh but usually anime we always record independently oh i did not know that so mostly it's like it's to your it, it, it they focus on the indiv uh, individually as opposed to to group okay that makes sense in a way it does yeah. make sense because you're re-recording over uh over a media that was that already exists uh yeah and sometimes it. there's so many overlapping cues <laughs> and stuff like that that it's kind of hard to manage those sessions when it comes to like working on cartoons and like some video games depending on the video game recording together if you want that organic sort of experience and that organic read works um especially on cartoons because like they're going to animate to the actors performances meanwhile with anime everything's already been animated everything's already been done it, we're a post-production process we're creating the english language version for basically accessibility um which is just you know dubs have just spiraled into being more than just an accessibility option at this point which is pretty insane to think um but uh but yeah whenever we record anime there's only been one instance that i know of uh that was done with david wald because that man's I'm a madman and I love him. Uh, where he was working, I think Hitori Jime, my hero, down in Houston, and he actually had some of the actors record scenes together. Um, but because, like, you know, so many overlapping things can happen, uh, whether it's like small gasps or reactions or people talking over each other, usually recording together is more chaos when it comes to anime. So it's better to just handle it one on one. It's a little bit more efficient too, because that way you can take the time to focus on one actor and their scenes. Because sometimes you also have just very like character heavy shows where it's not like big group things it's just one-on-one -on -one interactions so you know and then there's the big fight scenes and stuff like that too where you'll want to fine-tune some things so it's like instead of having the traffic like hey actor a you did great let's do this this that on these cues actor b let's do this is this, this on these cues it's less it's it's less like mental gymnastics for the for the director as well as well as the actor so you don't get direction confused that definitely makes sense. That makes a lot of sense. So, well, no, but that's great. No, I love. No, I loved it. I didn't even know there was going to be a second se season of Skate of the Infinity. I thought the we didn't either. Two years. Yeah, <laughs> so that's uh, it was. It was last year. They they had a, a big event in Okinawa, which is where the show like kind of takes place. Um, and it was uh, they announced the OVA, which we were like because they announced a, a project, a skate project, an animation project, which we didn't know what it was. We were we every, every with the fan base and even the actors were like okay it could be an OVA it could be a movie it could be a second season uh what would we want it to be or like Johnny Tsunami but snowboarding if it's a movie um we if it's an OVA we don't know what but if a second season ooh 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 so uh <laughs> we we were just kind of like freaking out because we we're like we know what it we know that there's more coming we just don't know when so a year goes by nothing year and a half last summer they have this whole event. Skate season two and OVA were announced in the same live stream and the same at the same event. And we freaked the hell out because we were like, we got what we wanted in then some. Let's go. <laughs> so, that is so great. Yeah. Oh, it was, it's, man. That's one of my favorite things that I got so excited. For. I've never gotten more excited about a show getting a second season and an OVA, I think, in a long time, especially for something that I've been in since Skate. Because oh. there's just something special about Skate. The fandom's great. The show's fantastic all across the board. It's just mwah, 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 yeah. mwah. 
it's actually kind of funny because like I don't even know what it was about Skate itself that kind of pulled me into it because I don't usually watch Skate. Like I mean, I've played like the last Skate thing I ever did was Tony Hawk on like mm -hmm. on my PS2 like back in the day in college. But like, it, uh, but when I saw this one, I was like, oh, I'm kind of interested. Uh, I'm kind of interested because I because uh, like I said, it kind of goes back to sports animes and stuff in general do some extra stuff and those kind of things like all the time and uh i thought this was uh something about it was kind of special when i watched it i was like this is freaking awesome this is a well animated series and then uh, and then showed different kind of aspects of like of character growth that i just i that you that i mean you don't really see every day i mean since mostly now it's usually isekai kind of stuff a lot of yeah. isekai stuff you know but uh yeah so it was very very really constructed and stuff so yeah i definitely loved it uh definitely love it so i uh, can't i can't wait to our second season that's that's yeah. gonna be nice yeah and, <laughs> all right and uh you like have a natural a naturally like high pitch uh uh, and I assume it's fairly uncommon for you to play the baddie in the series. And uh, when you played one of Don Flamingo's right hand men, men uh, Pika, <laughs> you already know where this is going. Like, how? Like, how was your experience to uh, to that? Like, did you know? Like, did you know who Pika was before you got that got that role? So, uh, for context, whenever usually back in the day, I think they've changed it now. Whenever Funimation, now Crunchyroll, would book you for something, they wouldn't always tell you what it was for or, like, what specific character you were. They'd be like, hey, this director needs you for X amount of time on this show. Can you come in at this time? Or when? what's your availability on these dates? So I got in a text uh, like, hey, Mike McFarlane wants, to, wants you for two hours on One Piece. Uh, can you come in at this day on this time? And this was, like, 2020, so I went into the studio and did all the COVID precautions. And I was like, Sure, I can do that. I'm going to have a named character in One Piece. Cool. No clue who it was going to be. And uh, my roommate, uh, who was also like a big One Piece fan and a uh, voice actor, uh, was like, I wonder who you could be. And I was like, I don't know. I really don't know. Uh, and because we because we remembered where like Funimation had left off dubbing One Piece, which was like somewhere in Dressrosa. And I was like, there's only one character I could think of, but I don't know. And I was Dellinger, who was actually played by, I think, uh, I believe Brandon McGinnis, a uh, good friend of mine. And so I go into the booth, um, and I'm the only person in the booth. There's nobody else there. Um, everybody's funneled in, like, remotely. And Mike's like, hey, man, so we got some fun for you today. Uh, so are you familiar with One Piece? I'm like, yeah, I'm, I'm like, mostly familiar. And he's like, cool, cool, cool. So I'm going to have you be playing um, this guy here. Uh, I'm not going to pan to him just yet. Uh, we're just going to preview, and we're going to uh, – we're just going to – you'll see what I mean. And so uh, we preview the first cue, and then I hear Pika's Japanese voice. And I hear how high and squeaky it is. And I see him and I'm dying of laughter. <laughs> and I'm like, there's no, there's no effing way, man. There's no effing way I get to be this guy. <laughs> um, and then Mike's like, yup. So uh, you're going to be Pika. Uh, <laughs> so let's, uh, let's, you know, we heard what he sounds like. Now let's, let's just kind of like spitball it. And we'll see if we need to do any adjustments. And then I, we, we went through it. I did my first takes. And uh, I believe my first one was like, are you sure about that? <laughs> or something like that and oh, uh dear. then he was, mike was just like yep that's perfect that's great. <laughs> uh, and so uh i pika recording pico was like uh it was kind of like uh, opening up a box of chocolates you never do what you're gonna get inside because <laughs> uh his some of his reactions were just great too it's just like ah! <laughs> which is just like so freaking funny um oh, uh it's, it's it's great <laughs> playing him was great i i got to play a character who gets laughed at for his voice which is hilarious uh i get to i got to play a character who has a one piece laugh and people make fun of him for his laugh and as a what jump, was the like, one hey, piece what was the one piece laugh that he did his, his laugh was a pika, 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 la, 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 la. <laughs> Oh, and no. people actually made fun of him for it. Like Zoro's just like, "What the heck was that laugh?" And he just laughs, and Pika goes like, "What's wrong? What's wrong with my laugh?" <laughs> um, but I learned that Mike. Uh, I eventually learned secondhand that Mike uh, wanted to like use somebody who had a naturally high pitched voice, kind of opposite what the Japanese did, where they had like this obviously like like deeper voice man pushing his voice to a really high and squeaky place, so it's like it sounds funny. Oh no. Uh, 
And uh, which is, like he, he was able to do it, but Mike wanted to grab somebody who had a much more naturally high pitched voice, and so he grabbed me, and it was <laughs> great. And so that was like some consistent one piece work for a while, and I was very happy about it. <laughs> yeah, that, it's so funny though, I loved it. I was like, when I started, when I heard it's like, oh, it's like, uh, did you hear the English dubbed voice of Pika? And I'm like, I did not even think of it. Let me, let me, I had to find it immediately, and I'm like, this is this is gold <laughs> so this is great i loved it um and uh my final question is uh your career in voice acting is start like it's starting to ramp up i mean you're still fairly new uh for the most part i would say uh like do you have any personal goals on where your voice acting career will take you or or, or plans in the future um so the the big thing that i want to do more of is like video games and stuff like that because you know that's the medium that i i arguably played and consumed just as much if not a little bit more than like anime and i love working on anime and like you know if the opportunity ever comes i'm still gonna work on anime because i love it i still love working on it uh for all of anime's eccentricities uh and stuff like that i still very much enjoy working on it but uh games mean a lot to me and uh so that's the reason why i moved to california was to pursue more video game work um and uh and so i really want to be like in a jrpg that's my big big goal because i love jrpgs so much uh if i could even be like uh in like a tales of game i would freak out about that because tales of franchise is like one of my favorites tales of the abyss is my favorite which one tales of the abyss it was my first and it's which my one, favorite which one was that on was that on the that was on the ps2 that was the oh. that was the uh second ps2 game that was recent in the states it was legendia which was on ps2 which came after symphonia and then it was abyss and then after abyss it jumped to the 360 with vesperia then it was ps3 exclusive with uh like uh, the rest of the mainline entries going forward um but uh i want to be in like a jrpg like that i just want to be more games i want to do more cool stuff uh, if I can work on more anime, then cool. I just want to do more than just anime. Um, and again, love it to death. I love anime. I will always still like love to work on it. Um, but there's just some bigger stuff that I would like to to try and experiment on, you know. And you know, I I'm I'm like you said, I'm still relatively young in my career. Um, I've only been a pro- I've been like professionally, I think, for uh, just about just five years now. Uh, I just hit my five year anniversary. Um, mine's like five, six ish. And, uh, I, I, I say this with as much objectivity as possible. I'm still in my mid twenties. Uh, I just turned 25 in October. So I know I still have room to like, I guess, pseudo make mistakes that I could bounce back from. So, uh, I figured why not try moving to California for a little bit, uh, see what work I can't get, see what I can and can't do and just go from there and uh so so far it's been cool uh i've booked some things that i can't talk about that i'm excited about um and uh and yeah that's so. cool i liked it i definitely like it and um just uh uh like so what if it what if theoretically they're like we want you to be a character inside kingdom hearts what would you say <laughs> like- i would freak the hell out man i would freak the hell out actually freak the hell out um <laughs> Like, dude, oh my god! Like, uh, I I joke about this with my friends all the time, but they like put the, like these these things in here. It's like, dude, if I could be in Kingdom Hearts, I'd freak out. Dude, if Haley Joel Osment ever decided not to be sore anymore, I would die if I ever even got the audition. They're like, hey, you'd be good sore. I'm like, don't put that thought in my mind. Don't put that thought in my mind. Don't put it in my mind. I'll freak out. I'll freak the hell out. I hope what? Haley Joel Osment doesn't doesn't want to like retire or anything like that for Kingdom Hearts. But if he ever did, I'm just saying, like, if the opportunity came up, I would die. If he I still reprised him, he still reprised his role as as a uh, Sora in the yeah. in Kingdom Hearts three. Wow, I didn't mm-hmm. even know. Wow, that is he's been Sora his entire basically his whole life at this point. Yeah, that is insane. I didn't even think. I thought they stopped after. <laughs> I thought they were like after two. I thought that was it. But no, God, mm-hmm. that's pretty cool. Yeah, he started as a wee teenager, like a, like a 12, 13 year old kid, and then mm-hmm. grew up to be a like a young adult, and then became uh-huh. a full ass adult. And it's became an even more full ass adult. <laughs> Just even more and more. Jesus. But though that's yeah. good. That's awesome. That I can yeah, I I'm pretty sure you you're definitely gonna get where you're wanting to go to. And I mean, it uh, it sounds like a really sound plan. So definitely, man. Keep up keep up the awesome work. Thanks, man. Yeah, and also uh, b- uh, before before I go, I always like to uh, ask: Is there like a way folks can 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 check like you know check your stuff out or uh, any social media stuff like that, f- that folks can see? I know you stream too, so yes, like I do. Yes, yeah. So like, if you have um, any place like to plug that in, 
Yeah, of course. Uh, all my socials are usually just my name, Ryan McKeand, or with like a VO to, at the end of there. My Twitter is Ryan McKeand. Uh, my Twitch is Ryan McKeand, but uh, not for long because uh, I, I've i been kind of, I've been not super vocal about this, but I've mentioned it before. Um, I'm going to be starting MeTubing uh, later this year. I have my model being worked on. I have my Twitter account for my model being made. And even on my streams on my Twitch channel, I usually am not on cam as often. Um, I haven't been able to stream the past couple weeks because I've just been so busy. Um, but uh, uh, he, if you want to follow my VTuber, uh, I'm going to start being more active on his account. It's uh, Zeph Alsea VT, Z E P H A L C E A underscore VT, or just no underscore one of the two. Um, he's uh, his basic premise is that he's a reverse isekai protagonist who gets isekai into our world. Uh, yeah, it's really cool. Uh, his design is super, super awesome. Uh, I've worked on it pretty hard with some friends, and the model's going to look fantastic. Um, but yeah, I try and stream as often as I can. Uh, I try to hit four streams a week. I play a lot of different games, just chatting stuff. I play RPGs. I play some recent stuff. I'm probably going to play the RE4 remake because it's coming out and or is out. One of the two. Can't remember. Uh, I think it is out. Be playing yeah. that soon. It is out. Perfect. Yeah. I'm buying that. <laughs> um, but uh but yeah uh and uh i'm also on tiktok but i don't really post as much on tiktok also at ryan McKeon. um yeah uh i love interacting with people i'm not super active on social media just because uh it gets pretty toxic sometimes but if you tag me in something and it's something i can respond to that i i love to interact show me your fan art show me your cosplay i'll always be like yo that's so cool um and stop on by to my twitch stream where you can hang out it's like one-on-one I also curse a, a pretty heavy amount, so it might be funny to you to hear me curse considering my voice. One of the two. <laughs> Get a laugh out of it. No, that, that's not, so wait, you're saying so your VTube name is Zeph v, underscore VT? Is that right? Uh, or? Zeph Alsea. Uh, that his last name is Alsea. So it's okay. Z-E-P-H-A-L-C-E-A VT. Yeah, underscore VT. So that's going to be that's the new that's going to be the new Twitch page? Yes, that I'm okay. going to just rename my current Twitch page to that. To so that. if you're following me already on Twitch, you eventually, maybe this month, if not next month, you'll start seeing the name change. So when I start transitioning the brand. Okay, yeah, yeah, I already follow you on it. So I'm just like, I just, I just want to be like surprised, like, who is this? <laughs> like, all of a sudden. So that that's cool. Okay, mm-hmm. well, that's cool. Well, guys, thank you. Uh, well, right. Th- thank you so much for geeking out with me it was awesome to talk to you i love of course, uh, dude. I, I loved it yeah and uh folks if you definitely love this interview with ryan mckeon uh you could li- listen to this amongst other uh awesome uh interviews that we've done on our website confreaksandgeeks.com that has the whole library archive of everything so uh once again this is davis signing off y'all take it easy <laughs>